Hello, and welcome back to Locusts and Wild Honey, the preaching ministry of Birth of the Baptist Orthodox Church in Pinckney, Michigan. I'm Father Methodius Kvastek, priest and rector of this community. I hope you will find the materials here to be spiritually beneficial. Thank you for joining me. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Congratulations to all, and welcome on the Sunday we call the Sunday of the Triumph of Orthodoxy, the first Sunday in Lent. This is a very festive occasion for us, because as you know, in history, heresies arose that concerned themselves with the incarnation of the Son of God. And the heretics, the heretics believed that the, that the miracle of the incarnation, that the miracle of the virginal conception and the virginal birth that was made possible by the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary. We have to remember that this is a, this is a dual power at work, that it is made possible by the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, according to the will of the Father in his great love for mankind, and according to the will of the Son, who deigned to become man like us. But the heretics could not resolve this logical question in their mind, how this was possible, and so many heresies arose, and ultimately those heresies affected uh, their belief uh, about whether or not God could be depicted, because to them God was the invisible God, and the invisible God cannot be depicted in color, line, and form. For many years, this heresy predominated in the empire, and it is often the case that the Orthodox people suffer from persecutions from without And they never suffer from persecutions from within the church. But within the empire, it's possible, because the empire and the church are not the same thing. Within the empire, it's possible to get people in power, in positions of authority even, where they can impose their confused and mistaken notions upon other people, and even upon the church in a certain sense, when they appoint bishops who are not chosen by the Holy Spirit, but are chosen by uh, world rulers. So we see that there is a, this is a, a phenomenon in history, and that for many years, the holy images, images of the Son of God, images of the Mother of God, images of the angels, and images of the saints, and images of the acts of God were prohibited. If you know anything about history, you know that certain other movements embraced these heresies. Islam embraced this heresy and imposed it even further later. And Protestantism embraces this heresy. And unfortunately, Protestantism and Islam have more in common than Protestantism has with true Christian faith. Recently, I had a Muslim man come and visit me in my home. He was a Sunni Muslim, and I told some of you about him. And he was the, probably the most intelligent Muslim man I've ever spoken with. And he thought that he was going to introduce me to things that I had not considered before. There was some, there was some information that he shared with me that I just didn't know about Islam, because I don't study Islam. But he was shocked to hear about Christ's first miracle in his, in his earthly ministry at the wedding feast. He'd never heard of this. And he was going to introduce me to some new things. He said, he said you have uh, small pictures of, of the truth. If I'm able to introduce you to larger pictures of the truth, would you be willing to accept them? And I said, it's not possible that you can introduce me to larger pictures of the truth than I have because I'm getting my pictures of the truth from the Holy Father's who have divine vision, and you're getting your so-called pictures of the truth from a heretic so-called prophet who's just a man and who doesn't have access to divine vision. So it's not possible. So I'm not even going to answer that question. He asked me to tell him about one single miracle that Christ performed. I thought, son, please, 
read a book before you come to a priest's home to challenge him about his orthodoxy. He was very respectful, though. I, I, I'm, not, I'm not trying to tease him. I was just, I, it, sh- it shocked me. And I said, well, very early in his, in his ministry, he transformed water into wine. And, his, and he was stunned. He'd never heard this before. How is that possible? How is that possible that he never heard this? I have no idea. But uh, what he wanted to criticize about orthodoxy was also what he wanted to criticize about Protestantism and papism. And orthodoxy is unique, distinct from either of those. And what I was able to show him was that his faith, which is false, which is demonic, has more in common with papist and Protestant faiths, which are each distinguishable from each other, but are very similar, both being demonic like Islam. I hope he comes back. I gave him uh, an assignment. I told some of you, I said, you're from Damascus? I said, you need to read St. Peter of Damascus. And if you want to talk about images and pictures of truth and reality, St. Peter of Damascus can share them with you. Someone from your own hometown, right? You should be able to relate to him. Well, truth prevailed after a long time, and the use of images in worship of the triune God was restored to the empire. When we say it was restored to the empire, this is not to say that it did not happen during that time, but there were penalties attached to it. And recently I was listening to a discussion between a, uh, between a, a, a Baptist, quote, theologian, and between an Orthodox priest, and, and it, was very, it was very good, and I learned a lot from it. The Baptist theologian, the Baptist pastor, wanted to identify Christendom with the church. And you have to understand, the reason that I mentioned that uh, iconoclasm was established in the empire, but that does not mean that the veneration of icons ceased. It means that it went underground. And there were even some dignitaries who continued to do it, including Empress Theodora. It was something that the empire ruled on, but it was imposed upon the church. It was imposed from outside of the church. And this Baptist minister wanted to identify all of history after the resurrection with the church. And he wanted to say that or he wanted to associate all of history after the resurrection with the church, and he wanted to identify the church only as those small pockets of representation where his views seemed in a very cryptic way to be established. And to do that, he did what, what people normally do. He went directly to the, father, the, the fathers of the church before Nicaea. And you know that it's very difficult for you to go to the, to the murky pre-Nicene waters and come back with any confidence that you understand the teaching of the church because there was so much confusion. Think about the, uh, think about the time frame wherein the epistles were written. There was so much confusion, not just com- confusion about theological truths, not just confusion about dogmatic truths amongst, amongst the people, but confusion about their practices in the churches and outside of the churches, in their homes. Confusion about whether or not it was right to have incestuous relationships with your father's wife, even. St. Paul had to, write in, he had to write to the churches and say, guys, that's out, okay? That, that should have been dealt with a while back, but that's out. And ladies, wear your tops when you come into the services, so much confusion. I don't mean to be crass, but these are, these are real things that were going on. And that is why we look to the era where the truth was vindicated and expressed in the forms that we have it today, right? It's not to say that it didn't exist before then. It's to say that the heresies that arose enabled the church to formulate her position definitively. Not that she didn't know it, but she was being attacked on all fronts. And so eventually she came to express herself in the forms that we have today. And this is how God is patient with man. This is how God is long-suffering and how he abides 
with his church. He's deposited the truth in the church at Pentecost in its fullness. And then that truth comes to be expressed over time. But the councils, and the, this was one of the problems I had with this, with this uh, discussion that was being had between the Baptist and the Orthodox, is that the Baptist's interpretation of the nature of of the ecumenical councils was taken for granted, and it should have been challenged. Who, who did the ecumenical councils pertain to? Who were they called by? Who were they for? How did they relate to the church? Were they a, were they a product of the church directly or indirectly? Right? These are all important questions, and they were not addressed in that discussion. And there were other very important questions. But the fact is that and the, the Baptist minister had a little bit of difficulty understanding what the Orthodox priest brought to the discussion. And I was, I was tracking with him, but the tracking with the Orthodox priest, that is. But the, the incarnation changes everything. The incarnation changes everything. And it's not logical. And it doesn't have to be. She was a virgin before conception. She was a virgin after conception. And she was a virgin after giving birth doesn't make any sense to us, to our minds. And it doesn't have to because it's a wonder, right? It's a wonder. It's a miracle. That's a miracle. And I've said this before. When babies are born, they're cute, they're sweet, they're cuddly, little noses. And then people say, oh, it's such a miracle. That is not a miracle. That is not, that's normal. That's normal. That's not a miracle. It's really cool, but it's not a miracle. We, and we need to remember these things. I'm looking at the I'm looking at this spectacular icon of the Mother of God that's in our cave right now, and it's as if light is shining forth from the cave. And we'll carry this icon in the procession today after the prayer behind the Amvon. And this icon, whoever carries it, Ivan and Tikhan, you'll be carrying it. You'll see on the back of it, there's the inscription of who it belonged to. It belonged to one of our ever-memorable nuns, Mother Theodora, who was from the uh, from the old roll core, and and then she wrote on the back of it. The back of it's in kind of bad shape. We're gonna soon. I'm going to work on restoring it to its uh, so so that it's so that it's whole again. But on the back of it, you can see uh, all the years that she had it blessed on the altar of however. Right? She documented that. It's very very nice to see that. Presumably, this icon has been presented in many places, and and this year we will carry our Most Blessed Lady with us in our procession uh, in the streets below in Pinckney. Uh, so this is the Feast of the Triumph of Orthodoxy. We A couple of comments on that, more additional comments on that. People in the world today want to, if they accept the icons at all, they want to accept them as works of art if they accept them at all. They're works of art. They are artistic renderings, okay? And it takes art. It takes skill. It takes art. The art includes the mixing of the minerals with the egg tempera, uh, the application of, of that, of the different layers, the different, um, the different methods that go into the iconography. There is a lot of art involved with it. But iconography is not art, Iconography manifests the very presence of God. That means that, it, that God in the icon comes to us, okay? Uh, when you hear the formula, and you've probably all heard this, right, of St. Basil the Great, when we, I, I'll, I won't quote it verbatim, but when we venerate the icon, the veneration goes to the prototype, right? Have you heard that? You've heard that formula? All right, huh? You heard it last night in the service. That's right. All right. So I want you to understand something about goes to. It doesn't transfer somewhere else. All right. It, you, don't, you don't venerate the icon and then the grace sort of packs its bags and gets on a mystical bus and goes somewhere to distribute that, that veneration. Why? Because in the icon, God comes to us. Okay. Very important. That's why we treat them with such reverence. It's never, it's never just a picture of something. It's never just a picture. This is why when we have the procession, we carry them with, with reverence. Reverence for holy things. You carry an icon properly in front of your, in front of your chest, 
and your hands cradle underneath it with utmost care. This is why we kiss the icons, because God comes to us in them. Parousia. Another thing about the icons that's very important, and this is why people uh, this is why people mock them sometimes, and this is why the Christian faith is mocked. Do you notice in the iconography, we have some in this in this holy temple. It, it'll be very wonderful one day because because all of the iconography here. All, all of the prominent iconography here will one day be by the hand of our own resident iconographer. And when people come into this temple, it'll be a very unique experience because there will be no other temple like it. There, there's another temple that has a lot of your iconography. There's a few, I think. But this one will have almost exclusively. And, and, uh, and this will be a very special experience for us. It's kind of like how, how the parishes should produce the clergy. They should kind of bubble up like when you're watching the, the, the kettle boil for tea. You start to see the little bubble, the little tiny pinhole bubbles at the bottom, then you know it's ready. And that's how a parish should be. It should be a percolator of grace. It should be percolating and producing its own future. It should be percolating and producing its own servers. It should be percolating and producing its own clergy, its own choir, its own iconography, its own uh, rubrical department. These are all things that, that a parish should do. Even a mission parish is capable of this. But if you look at most of the icons, they don't look like photographs. They look, some of them look strange, right? In some of the renderings, they don't look... Um, the proportions are different than what we expect. I'm looking at this icon of the Theotokos the, that I brought this morning, and this one is probably the most realistic-looking icon that we have here. What is this icon called? The Twin Temptations? Twin Passions. Twin Passions. From Mother Theodora. Uh, may, may, may God help and have mercy on her, and uh, may her memory be eternal. But if you look at some of the others, they, they don't look... They don't look um, realistic in the in the artistic sense. The reason that they don't look realistic in the artistic sense is because being the uh being the vessels, the precious vessels whereby the grace of God comes to us, penetrating time and space and and occupying itself in wood and in uh boards and in paints and in strokes and in colors. Something is going on there that is not normal. In our, in our fallen estimation of things. Something is going on there that is above nature. Above nature. These are depictions of theological realities. And that's why they look the way that they do. Because they're trying to communicate to us in the way that they're composed something that cannot be discovered in nature apart from the grace of God. Does that make sense? Okay. But Christians look like everybody else. So the icons are mocked because they don't look like Rembrandt's pictures. And Christians are mocked because they do. We want the same things everyone else does. We're lazy about our souls. It's always rest, 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 rest. We want culinary delights. We want sophisticated gizmos. There are very few ways that you can tell us apart from everyone else in the world. Very few ways. We don't want to come. You read that, that letter that I sent you. That was, those are not my words even from, uh, from St. Valentin Svantitsky. Those were not even my words. Those were written a long time ago. But I felt like they, I had written them. They're the same things that, I can, that I'm concerned about. In our time, people can't, you know, people, people just can't be bothered. They can be bothered for a half an hour, he says. And then they just want to go quietly home, back to their jobs, back to their money-making, he says, back to their careers, back to their families. And we have the opportunity to be in the presence of the very vessels containing the grace-filled presence of God in the holy icons because in the wisdom of God, the Holy Spirit restored the veneration of icons 
to the empire, and, and it's preserved for us today. So in our veneration of the icons, we should start to take on some of the otherworldly appearance that is depicted in the icons. The grace of God should be, just as our veneration goes to him through them, his grace should be communicated to us through them. And that means that we should be radically being transformed. Right? This is why we celebrate the triumph of orthodoxy. What is the triumph of orthodoxy except that the grace of God can awaken man to his condition? That is the triumph of orthodoxy. How does God do that? He does it through normal and extraordinary means, if you've been following along in the path to salvation. You heard Cyprian reading in the epistle before the gospel today. You heard from Hebrews, from St. Paul's epistle to the Hebrews. You heard wonderful things. You heard about these holy people. This week we celebrated the, the holy martyrs of Sebast. We celebrated St. Theodore, Tyro. This is amazing. This was an amazing week. We, we had a three-day fast. We pushed ourselves a little bit. We put ourselves in the physical condition where we can start to receive something from God, right? Because we weakened ourselves. We weakened ourselves a little bit. Did we receive from God? Did we listen to, did we listen to things like, Ice is cold, but paradise is sweet. Did we listen to that? And then did we go, did we listen to that? Words like that. And then did we go seek warmth? Or did we experiment with it a little bit to see if what they said was true? Do you know in today's gospel, we read, uh, the Lord says to uh, Nathaniel, he says that I saw you under the fig tree. Nathaniel is, he's sort of caught off guard by this, and he's, Nathaniel being a discerning man, a true Israelite, according to our Lord, he questions further. He questions further. And he says, okay, where do you come from? And you know, the, the prophecy isn't that, he, that this man comes from this place, so set, set me straight here. This is how Nathaniel is, and we should take notice of this. He's not just uh, happy-go-lucky. He's not just, oh, is that what the, is that what the new thing is? Oh, is that what the new, um, is that what we believe now? Is that the, is that what the new, uh, you know, it's always with, or, with the Orthodox, the Orthodox are as trendy as anyone else. And if you, if you follow on YouTube, it's always one trend after another. Unfortunately, you don't know who these priests are. Now, you know, one of them that makes a lot of noise. Now we finally know who his bishop is, uh, Bishop Patriarch Marth- Bartholomew. And everyone still listens to him. Why does anyone still listen to Father Peter Hears? Why does anyone even listen to him? Who cares what he says? We've got other things that we're doing. We've got other things that we're concerned about. We're not concerned about every wind of doctrine that blows around. We're not supposed to be like those who amass teachers unto themselves to tickle their itching ears, Orthodox people. But this is how people are. And you know that people are not going to miss those, those, uh, those broadcasts. They're not going to miss them. They're going to immediately consume them. And the, the Lent is going by. And they, they're up to date on all of the new trends in genuine orthodoxy, all the new trends in world orthodoxy. And have they worked on their souls once? Have they taken time to actually stand in the frozen lake no, it's trends and comfort for genuine orthodoxy today. Trends and comfort. Matushka had a migraine yesterday, and I was thinking about the, the holy martyrs of Sebast, and I was thinking about her head. You know, when you have these things, you have to think, of, you have to think spiritually when these things happen to you. When you have a headache, what should you think about? We have the icon of St. John, St. John's head in a charger. When you have a, when you have a headache, God is giving you grace. You can think about St. John's head in a charger. You can think about the findings of his head. You can think about the, all of the martyrs who couldn't be killed in any other way, but by decapitation. These are saving thoughts. These are ascetical thoughts. 
This is a way of absorbing your pain so that it can do something salvific for you. The Holy Martyrs of Sebast, she, I came back into the house in the morning and I could hear in her voice that she had a migraine. I said, you have a migraine? All right, Matushka, do this with me. Take off your socks and let's go stand in the snow. And we, we, we went and stood in the snow until she was, I said, are you still feeling your headache? No. What are you feeling? She said, I'm freezing. My feet are freezing. I said, okay. So we went back inside and I said, all right, after morning prayer, she stood by the fire a little bit and I said, okay, how does your head feel? And she said, well, I, I don't know. I'm just thinking about my feet right now. And you see how our bodies are? Do you see how, do you see how we can change the way that we feel, the way that we focus by the, by the, by the way that we affect our bodies, right? So just a simple, obvious example of what fasting is supposed to do for us. So then I let her thaw out a little bit. I said, all right, back outside. So we went outside and I was putting snow up on my legs and I put snow up over her feet and made a big pile of, pile of snow over both of her feet. And I said, now, how do you feel? And she said, well, my head doesn't hurt. It, it did. The migraine didn't go away. That's not, the point is not, oh, I found this mystical method of taking away the migraine. No, that's not it. Then I said, okay, how do you feel now? And she said, I'm freezing again. I'm really starting to freeze. But it didn't, it took longer the second time. The, lo- the second time it took longer to freeze, didn't it? Yeah, it did for me too. And so I said, now how do you feel? And she said, freezing again now. And I said, but, but think about Motovilov, right? Father Seraphim is standing with him in the snow in the middle of the forest. And he's covered with snow covered with snow, with inches of snow on his shoulders. And Father Seraphim says, how do you feel now? And he says, well, I feel warmth. He says, but how can that be? Because look at yourself. And he finally looks to himself and he's covered with snow. How can it be that you feel warmth? You're covered with snow. Motovilov put himself in the situation where the grace of God could come to him. And we, Matushka and I repeated this process two more times total. I think we did it. I think we did it four times. So we did four times. So I let her go back in and thaw out and then come back out and freeze again. And the whole while I was thinking that this is the way that our life, our life is. And this is the way that our life has to be as Orthodox Christians. We always go from some sort of discomfort in a movement to comfort, not from, not from God, which would be good if we did. But we always go from some sort of discomfort directly. We start to flee toward comfort. And in the church, we learn it, that discomfort is not a reason for us to seek comfort, but a reason for us to look in and see what is it spiritually that is ailing me. This is how we have to think. So sometimes we can exchange one discomfort for another discomfort, and we can see sometimes St. Ignati Brianchaninov says we can see if it's a temptation or not. He says sometimes if you, have a, if you have a headache before you pray, it could be a demonic temptation. So he says to, to test it, pray. And if it goes away during prayer, then it's possible that it was a demonic temptation. And if it persists after prayer, then it could be a somatic thing, right? Maybe, some, maybe you need to take a, an a leave or something. But you have to test it first. We always run to the leave. We always run to the comfort. If we're going to imitate the, uh, the saints, if we're going to imitate those who uh, lost life and limb to preserve the veneration of, of icons in the church, this is amazing. We have to learn to abide discomfort to some degree. The epistle that Kiprin read today listed so many, one after another, people who undertook great extreme, acute hardships. Did you hear it? And this is the cloud of witnesses. Through the prayers of our Holy Fathers, the fathers of the Seventh Ecumenical Council, through the prayers of our holy patron, St. John, the forerunner, who gave up his holy head because of truth, And by the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, may we be deemed worthy to relate to this cloud of witnesses. Amen. We hope you found these materials 
to be spiritually beneficial. If you benefit from what you hear and would like to know more about orthodoxy generally or about genuine orthodoxy, please don't hesitate to contact me. If you would like to visit us, please check out our website at birthofthebaptistorthodoxchurch.com for the service schedule and contact information. It would be an honor to meet you. Also, keep up with us on Facebook or find me on Instagram at Art of Prayer Workshop, where you can find beautiful, traditional, hand-painted icons as well as other devotional items for your home chapel or church. If you'd like to support us financially, donations can easily be made through PayPal at fellowheirs at hotmail.com. Please remember us in your prayers.